What's the most rewarding aspect of building an international team? Um, as an Australian company, knowing that you're world class. Yep, yeah, fantastic. That's it, you know you're up there. Yeah, great. So that's where everybody fails. They either burn through their cash or they, or they suddenly realise, oh, we haven't got the right people on board for the wrong reasons or right reasons. I love this episode of the Make It Happen show because we hear about a business that bootstrapped for 17 years before taking on its first round of capital to fuel its global growth. We're joined by Bruce McKenzie of Human Force, and Bruce takes us through their journey of starting as a small Australian-based technology business to now being one of the global players in the workforce planning field. Bruce takes us through the key lessons he's learned about how to bootstrap a business profitably. He talks about how purpose is so vital to uniting your team and helping them to achieve great things. And he gives his key lessons like cash being king as you grow your business along the way. Let's get into it. Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of the Make It Happen show. I'm Tim Morris, joined by Bruce McKenzie, the founder and CEO of Human Force. Hello. Hey, welcome. <laughs> great to have you here. This Thank is fantastic. You. So um, now you guys have had a lot of great achievements lately, but one that stood out for me is that the last five years you've grown 40% every single year, so it's basically doubling every year. How on earth have you made that happen? Well, we bootstrapped from the whole, from the start of the business so in 2002. And in the last five years, we sort of took off and the, the market came to us and mm -hmm. started to believe what our vision was. Mm -hmm. um, and literally the banks were, we, we did overdrafts and, oh, wow. and mortgaged the heck out of my properties. So it's that classic overnight success, you know, only like 14 years of hard work oh, and then no, boom. 12. <laughs> 12. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're speeding through it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> look, it was, it was also, nobody did what we did when we first started. There was a couple of companies we both started around the same time, but mm -hmm. yeah, it was just, a, it, it, our time had come and yeah. we were ready to, to take it and you know, away we went. Great, so, well, so what does Human Force do exactly? Well, basically we're a, an organization that does, in the old terminology, would have been a rostering mm -hmm. solution for, mm -hmm. a, um, but we do really complicated businesses. So we do the scheduling for like organisations like major convention exhibition centres or big retail chains or hospitality. Mm -hmm. And that led us into stadium and that's how we grew offshore. So four years ago we went to the UK. Yeah. So how, like roughly how many people would be on some of these rosters, one of these really big events? Um, Wembley, when they have the FA Cup final, they'll have 2,900 come to work in about 45 minutes. Oh wow, and they've all got to get to the right place and clock on and, and get to work seamlessly and you guys help manage that? Yeah, and we also do things like that. It's a, we, we extended beyond just the rostering to actually mm -hmm. create a, a complete solution. So in that case, they produce a, a, um, a, a wrist bracelet like, mm -hmm. the, like they can get in a hospital, but it mm -hmm. tells them, it gives a barcode as to which point of sale they can open. Mm -hmm what uniform they should be wearing and obviously mm. where they've got to work. So we're directing them around the, the facility as well. So we're right around Wembley. And yeah. so that's the sort of thing we do. That's super interesting. And it's like, so years and years and years ago when I used to work in hospitality, in a very small operation compared to some of these things you're doing, we used to do the rostering for that and also getting people out of jobs. And, you know, we used to work in actual like, paper diaries, people were writing right, their availability, yeah. they would match it up to the jobs they had to do, and then they'd have to come in. We didn't even email them their rosters, they had to come in, get them, physically get them, and that would be their work for the next two weeks. This is back, what, late, uh, like 1997, 1998, it would have killed for a solution that could digitise it. But it didn't change. I mean, when we went to Wembley only five years ago, they were still doing manual processes. They had 31 agencies with 31 desks, each with uh, a Delaware North person and a, a Wembley person yep. clocking people in and signing them in. So they're a good thing. And so there's just the labor saving of, of just the, the people to get them into work. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously when we did Arsenal, it's a secure venue. So therefore we have to, everybody's got to be police checked and there's some mm. using the biometric. Mm. So there's a high level of security built in now. So it's sort of played to our business. Yeah, that's actually reminded me of something else. So I used to say, like working in catering, you, you get to know all the ins and outs of different buildings and all the secure buildings that we used to work in. I can guarantee every secure building in the world, like museums, have a back door that's left open for the security guards to have a smoke Every time, <laughs> that's exactly. Except in the football world, particularly, yeah. 
in the EPL, there are so many people trying to blag their way in with fake tickets and stuff like this. There is no back door open because they're gotcha. streaming through it. Yeah, we were just dealing with Melbourne Museum. I don't think it's got quite yeah. the level of security yeah. that uh, yeah. it's, it's, <laughs> it's not, like, not an FA Cup. No. <laughs> and so, what's the um, what's the technology platform that you manage this on, and how have you developed that over the years? Well, originally we came out in 2002 with a product where we had a little fingerprint device and. What we were looking to do was really just to take away the actual business owner's biggest problem. And we started with retail and hospitality and mm. did a lot of supermarkets. A lot of the big IGAs were early adopters. Um, and that just sort of snowballed from there. But that, wasn't, and that was all on premise. And it was only about six, seven years ago that we actually put our system all cloud based and mm. took it all to the cloud. Oh, so, so originally you go in, you in install a solution for this particular supermarket or chain, they'd run it on their own infrastructure, and, and now you've gone and made it so it's more available just through... Well, it's just a SaaS solution yeah. now. But yep. it's all, like when you would be offering shifts out to them, and it's not only with, with the events business, I mean, we do some of Australia's biggest, like, um, blood services or um, aged care operators, you know, mm. with thousands of employees, and so they'll like, actually offer shifts out, shift swapping. Um, you and I could swap a shift as long as our manager were approved it mm -hmm. via the app. Yep, um, that's cool. So that's cool. That's great functionality. Well, it also means that you and I have to be at the same level within the business, and mm. also that we're not ending up because of our awards in Australia. That was what gave us the great leverage offshore. Mm. Yeah, because I get so again take it back to my very small experience with this area in the, in the hospitality rostering. It was you know we had to we had to know what everyone was good at. And, and you just kind of knew it, and that's how you can match them up to the right jobs. But if we actually had it systemized, so we actually knew what people's capabilities were, what, what we were swapping like for like in terms of what we're supposed to be paying, paying them, that would be hugely beneficial. So when you left, there would have been a hole in their operational efficiency because the next person, unless they worked side by side with you, wouldn't have known mm. what, you were, what you knew. Well, so that's, that's not the only thing I'm missing when I left, but you know, no, no, no. <laughs> oh, you're charming wit, I forgot that. <laughs> so, sorry. Um, but it was, it was interesting what you're talking about, because that's exactly what we did. And therefore, we have, like within aged care, obviously, if you're a registered nurse or an enrolled nurse, you, but in a lot of hospitality now and venues, there's like different levels of um, grade of person, skill set. Can they do mm. this? Can they do that? Mm. Have they got certifications to do this? And of course, you must have certain levels of certification to actually even open, like a, mm. a pub has to, you can't mm. have a pub without somebody with the, the correct you know, RSA, RCG, all of these acronyms that we with gaming or alcohol, mm. or food mm. prep, etc. Yeah, that's so super that, interesting. Yeah, so that's what we do. Uh, and so the efficiencies that business must get out of this must be incredible, not just in terms of getting rid of those people on the desk, checking people in, but the rostering efficiency, the compliance efficiency. What are some of the benefits that companies see typically? Well. Uh, this is how we only ever used to look at our system. Yep. And so where our success come from. So I'll answer your question. Um, it can usually run if you're coming off a manual system, like mm. your business had we talked to you in 2002, probably would have thought maybe 3% of your wage bill, mm -hmm. which is fairly significant to any business. Yeah. We used to guarantee 2% when we mm -hmm. were in the early days. Yeah, wow. Or the system was free after the first year. Um, just a reduction. But w what we did as well, five, six years ago, we started, with, particularly with the app, um, and it was the early days of, you know, we were the tyranny of, you know, app uh, releases by, uh, you know, iOS changes and it had crash and all that stuff. So we just kept, pat, you know, bashing our way through. But we realised that if we solved for the actual worker, engagement was the future for that, not necessarily. So the saving everybody mm. could do, but the ability for them to rate their shift and mm. for you to rate me as your manager or you as my manager mm. and you and me as your employee. Mm. Um, therefore, then you'd look at when you go to roster or schedule people, who was rating there. So I'm only rostering on the people that like me. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. no, I think that's, that, that's a very, very powerful business case. Though. It's like, look, this thing's going to pay for itself just in uh, save labor costs. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is your employee engagement, the feedback you can get from them. And so it pays for itself easily and all these benefits on top of that. That's what you're really getting it for. That's compelling. Well, you can't get people in this space easily anymore because there's a, it's a difficult environment to work, um, you know, and you want to maintain the, the relationship with them. And there's lots of competing um, work for a gig worker now. So, mm. so we really mm. solve for the worker. That's our sort of main um, main drive now. Yep. Because the, if we can get a great relationship with the with the the worker there, I mean, if we just call them a casual, which is the Australian term for it, but hourly mm. workers or part timers globally, they're they're you know they're still the same people who make your coffees everywhere. Yep. Yep. They're the people they actually we want to have a relationship with. So allowing them to know, okay, you've got three shifts and you can balance up, which one should you take? Mm. Like, should I go to my local pub? So I'm at, like I'm at my local hotel, I can go to a, 
an Accor hotel, say the Sofitel, or I can go and work at a stadium. Which one? Travel time, mm. costs, etc. How much you'll earn. So we've just started that process and in integrating that in, and it's really exciting because our clients at first were concerned that we might be sort of, you know, our, our clients who pay our bills, but realised in the long term that the maintaining that relationship and engaging their staff is is important. Mm. Well, and, and yeah, and with the rise of the gig economy and people uh, not necessarily having long careers, but going and working some over here, some over here, some over here, actually being able to uh, design for them and make sure they have a really good experience and keep them around for longer is going to be hugely beneficial. And I think th there's also um, governmental pressure coming out, like in the in the UK at the moment, the, mm. the, the, their tax office is, is um, prosecuting um, a lot of people, particularly in hospitality and retail, mm. that if they don't pay the minimum wage properly mm -hmm. to them, uh, and, and if they prescribe a uniform, then they have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. It's no longer good enough to say you need black and whites to work here because that's part of that. And if you only earn minimum wage, therefore you mm. don't. So there's those sort of societal changes that the governments are bringing in. And that's, that's consistent right across. Well, France has definitely has already done it. And England is, well, the UK is pushing heavily on that at the mm -hmm. moment, like huge fines, 400,000 pound fine for a, a corporation that didn't do it properly. Mm. Well, and you've obviously got a lot of experience in Europe because you've expanded well beyond Australia. Where, where are your operations now? Well, we've got offices in um, London, um, in Southwark. We've got one in Singapore. We've got all, all over Australia. Um, the reason we went, I'm sort of probably jumping to a, a, a question in, 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 in a moment, but the reason we went for a US partner, not a local partner, was that we wanted to expand in the US. Mm -hmm. So with Karen Millen and Superdry globally, we have mm -hmm. um, 30 or 40 locations there in all their different tax, major tax jurisdictions. Wow. So we realised that we could do it. So now we're just basically looking to, to use some of the capital to, to grow over there. So well, actually, let's rewind before we look into all sure. of this expansion. Like, so how, how have you gone from, I'd, I'd just love to hear the story about, all right, we're early 2000s, found this business, you know, start with maybe just a, a small use case of rostering, and then now you're at like global, right? So what are the major steps along there? When did you say, hey, we've really got something here? Maybe when was your first overseas office? How has that gone? Well, basically, we, there was a certain amount, like there was a movie many years ago, Garandhog Day, and it mm. felt about sort of <laughs> 10 <laughs> years into the business, we thought, okay, what are we gonna do with this? We've really, we've really, we're sitting there fighting a lot of Australian businesses. This is all pre-deputy and mm -hmm. the, the, the SaaS driven businesses mm -hmm. and the capitalised business come to the market. And so we'd sort of grown out of a small retail hospitality and kept growing and growing and looking for everything we could do in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, and then one of our clients said, well, you, we, we're the best in this global, we're part of a global organisation and our wages and our service levels are better than all the other countries and other regions. And the only reason I put down to it was our product. And so that mm. company said, would you like to come across to the UK and set up? And so as an entrepreneur at heart, I went, yeah, that's the business plan. Let's do it. <laughs> like yeah. we've got a client. <laughs> we had Wembley. Like I thought if you go to a marketplace and you can do Wembley, you pretty yep. well can do anything. Absolutely. And then we picked up Royal Ascot and we've got Lords and we do a bunch of football clubs yeah. and then Caramel and Super Dry and... All so, came from there. And yeah. so, maybe, so maybe the main lesson I'm taking from that is, you know, you spend a lot of time focusing on the Australian market. Maybe it was getting a bit of a red ocean and then this opportunity came yeah. to launch into a much bigger market and, and you embraced it, which is fantastic. And then that's when everything really unfolded. Yeah, and it was all, it was all brand driven, but the, the logic of your question is exactly right. You know, it, was, it wasn't thinking about blue ocean. It was more just sitting there thinking, we, we didn't realise how good all of us were in Australia. Mm. Um, you know, like you, when you look at the workforce management, there are two, you know, thousand pound gorillas out there, both are PE owned. Mm. One's last transaction five years ago was um, an equity sort of manoeuvre between Blackstone and, and, and Hellman and the Singapore government for like eight billion bucks. So, you know, we, that's who we, we fight. Yeah. So it's really good. Like, at least we know who our thousand pound gorilla is. <laughs> and then there's, there's, a, there's a, a 900 pound one in there as well that's backed by, I think it's Insight Venture Partners out of New York. Yeah. So for us to go and fight those guys, we realised we had to have American partners in our corner. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, that so, that sort of, so, so that was sort of all snowballed off that same five year window, even though it sounds a long time. It just, it just happened. Yeah. And so, uh, so it's like, Building the foundation, building the foundation, a couple of opportunities open up and then you have a couple of years of really strong growth, uh, which the last five years. What are the main things you've been focusing on in order for that growth to happen? Um, it sounds a, a little bit sort of, it, it's on the softer side of the business. Like mm. we've been talking about all like the product and the clients and all that, but the, the, real, the real driver behind it was that we, we had a purpose 
mm. and that was gave us motivation. Like we didn't, I didn't need to ask my guys in the middle of the night to, to stay up or if I was over the UK and we had a problem, they're all up to four or f five in the morning. That's what you've got to do. Like there was no, there was no option for us, but there was no pushback either. They were mm. just saying, oh, you know, they say, hey mate, can I come in and work at midday? I said, yeah, you can work from home, I don't care. Yeah, because <laughs> they were just, you know, like everything, software always has its moments and you know, mm -hmm. we're on our first big event, um, we were with AWS from really early days. And mm. so we would, had used that when they opened in Singapore, not even here. Mm. And so for us, then we're in EU and GDPR and it's mm. really complicated. Mm. So that was why I knew that if you had everybody, we had a purpose and, and, and oh, a vision, I guess, but we, we just knew where we wanted to go. So it was yeah. easy to... And so, if you, and so particularly through that stage, what, what was the purpose that everyone was uniting around? It had to be big. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 you know, at 54, I've seen and read a lot of books and stuff. But I mean, our big, hairy, our audacious goal was to change the way the world works. So yeah. we trademarked that. Yeah. Um, which was right. weird. We got it. Wow. <laughs> so that's now impressive. We, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think we had right people, right place, right time, which everybody in our industry uses. Yeah, yeah. We've trademarked that as well. But we'll let them keep going until one day we'll just say, oh, by the way. but <laughs> Royalties. Yeah. Well, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. But yeah, I, I guess, you know, just and therefore solving for both sides of the equation. Mm -hmm. um, we get lo lots of good stories out of our business from the, the people who work there as well as the people who own the business. Mm -hmm. So it's actually heartening to you know, have a good growth business, a really good story, be able to attract good partners and investors, mm -hmm. but also do some good for the people who use it. You know, the ability to be able to share with your flatmates that you've got a shift and you're gonna mm -hmm. be not home or your mom, all this sort of stuff so we can actually share, mm -hmm. and share their gigs. Yeah, I think it's actually one of the things that businesses don't talk about enough internally it is the success stories from their customers because a lot of time particularly customer facing teams a lot of time when they hear from the customers when the things are going wrong right but there's so much good stuff they're doing there so how how do you guys share those customer success stories in human force well first of all our support team is called customer success yep there you go. Helps. so that's the first <laughs> thing uh, account managers are called value realization because yeah. the real issue we've got where we've got a, a, a deep install base particularly in the Australian New Zealand market of on-premise so software, both ours and, and competitors, mm. you know, bringing them across. So the stories are really integral to the business. Like we, we, we have a, a, or every week, every Tuesday at 8.15, the whole of the business is online for a meeting. Mm. Um, everybody, all hands. Um, and we do a lot of stuff where we support and, and praise both the client side of the business as well as the team. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we, we, we really um, love tenure in the business. So every quarter, I think it's every two months we celebrate, um, everybody gets a, for every year of service, they get a balloon and a hundred bucks a year and a voucher for that. And yeah. uh, like a helium balloon. That, so it's great for about a month. The office looks like it's a kid's party. <laughs> um, How many of the balloons get sucked up so they speak like uh, really high voices? <laughs> well, that sort of got old after about five years of it, but it's still, new, newbies always give it a go. <laughs> I've got helium headaches. Oh, yeah. that anymore. Well, the customer success uh, team are pretty young, so they like them. <laughs> so Lisa. But we had a couple, you know, in a, in a drunken moment, I said, at one of the parties, I said, if anybody makes it to 10 years, we'll give them 10 grand. So we've had four of those in the oh. last three years. So that was that's a bit scary. That's, that's, that's good, though. It sounds like an expensive promise, but actually the commitment and, and what you've got for people staying around that long which must be hugely beneficial. Well, I also knew that we, we weren't looking to, to, to form an ESOP in the early days. So mm. it was... How do you keep people motivated? You mm. can keep giving them money, but there's certainly a ceiling when you sit there and think, oh, this doesn't make sense. Mm. Or, or you, you would say, hey, you want to head off to another, you know, go learn more skills and, and potentially come back, which we've had a fair few boomerangs where they've gone out and mm -hmm. come back. Mm -hmm. But it was more just with that ongoing, you, you, you don't keep people for that sort of tenure nowadays, mm. especially mm. in a hot market. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we've got four of them that have, have made it to 10 years. Yeah, well done. Well, it must be, I'm sure it's the whole team environment and uh, aligning with the purpose that kept them there. It's not just the, the little reward at the end. No, it, well, I think it is when they're about eight and a half years in, but they just go, <laughs> they might, they might be sick of last six sick months. <laughs> yeah. But none of them have gone yet, which is great. So yeah, wow. yeah I, I think, as I said, motivation, you know, it's like giving people you know, a stock in, a, in a, a, a non-public company. It's like a one day high, what are you going to do with it? Mm. Mm. You know, so for us, we, we've got a, a strong ESOP within the business now and we know where okay, we're yep. going. And that all had to be built because yep. of the investment. Yep. Yeah, well, so I'd love to get to that and we'll definitely get to that. But, but I, really what I want to dig into first is, so 17 years or so of bootstrapping. God, it sounds a long time. <laughs> <laughs> 17. <laughs> That's enough, no, no. Right. <laughs> um, So you didn't take on 
any outside investment, not even private investors. Um, like, how have you done that? Because it's very rare, actually, these days that we hear about this, particularly in a technology business uh, where it is about rapid expansion. So how did you build the business profitably over that period of time? Um, well, my first business I started in 1985, straight from uni at 21. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate enough to float that in 2000. Yeah, wow. um, but that was post crash. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was an unhappy time to be in IT. It was a horrible time to start a new business mm -hmm. in 2002. Nobody wanted to buy software. Nobody had budget. You know, I was in retail and hospitality. Both industries were smashed. Yeah. Um, but it, it really, we didn't know any different. Mm -hmm. like we're a bit like the hummingbird, you know, it just you know, the old analogy where nobody told it it shouldn't fly. It was, so we just kept flapping. And yeah. So it was, that purpose was really just to, to do what needed to be done for our clients and for ourselves. And, mm -hmm. and, and so, and just, we've always had good financial control mm -hmm. um, and understood the, what we did and mm -hmm. why we did it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting now, I look at a lot of businesses where they've got capital, but once you cut through their sort of, their pitch, deck mm. and then say but why do you really exist mm. you know what, what what's the vision be you know the dream beyond the dream it, it, it's not there so for mm. us we always tried to have a more altruistic loftier um vision if that makes sense yeah yeah no absolutely it does yeah and so then then you've really uh, had accelerating growth over the last couple of years um, you, ha you did say, hey, we do need access to more capital here to fuel that growth. Uh, and so you have gone through a recent raise. Yep. Um, how's that process been? What position are you in now? And what are you looking forward to? Oh, um, well, it was, it was really difficult. It was hard work. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, I needed to be near the business, but I also needed to not be near the business because mm -hmm. the last thing you want to do, it's a... A double-sided sword, like a you know, two-edged sword. Like, uh, can the business exist without its founder? Mm. Um, but at the same time, you know, what's the founder's role, etc. Yeah. You know, it has to exist without its founder as well. Because he's extent. overseas, and because yeah. I wasn't local raising capital, and yeah. so, you know, when we put our head on the chopping block. Like, we went straight to the valley. We did San Francisco, um, Menlo Park, New York, or Manhattan, and Boston, mm. and, and worked that market to find out who was interested in mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got to remember, like they look at the business going, we've got all these things that are very, on huge growth curve, mm. um, and here we are coming in. And it was we had three companies that um, agreed to to terms with us, mm -hmm. um, and in the end, it was we were in a really great position that we could um, select the partner we wanted. But yeah, great. Yeah, it's hard work. The, the valley's not like here. No. Well, yeah. so what are the, some of the key differences? Um, Deal flow, like when you go in there um, and they're ruthless, mm -hmm. like you have one hour. Um, mm. The questions, they're all the, you know, the market's hot and frothy at the moment. So the smartest young um, guys and girls are in, particularly in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we talk to like, you know, all equal to, um, you know, Sand Hill Road, all the, all the top um, firms. Mm -hmm. um, and in the end, as I said, it, they're, they're, they're ruthless in the way that they value their time. Mm -hmm. They can really cut through. So by about the fourth or fifth um, company we'd go to, we, re we we just stopped and really quickly gathered our breath and re 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 did our debt completely. Mm. We, so fortunately, we sort of ranked them in the order, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and the fifth was important, but was was a, a massive one. So we thought, mm, okay, so we won't do that with the ones we really want. Um, but it was hard work. Yeah, was, yeah, and uh, and just keeping it on point with them and what they're looking for. Well, I mean, and I imagine you weren't really fitting into the mold of what they're used to seeing no. either. It, well, no. just uh, the fact that you've, be, you've been around as a business for so long would be unusual for them. I think, I think that, say like with Excel KKR, they have a, a, a strong portfolio of um, companies with um, a, few old, a fair few older, I've been to their, their, um, their CEO conferences and this sort mm -hmm. of thing. So they're older um, people who still got really successful businesses and mm. are really happy, but have decided they want to either exit or to grow further or mm. take them public. Mm -hmm. um, and they're very like they're very strong on you know we we are can only float on three bosses and not the ASX mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. That's not an mm -hmm. option for us. <laughs> and it's just you know that was their yep. their and that was consistent with a lot of funds. Yeah, that he said, look, you know, Nasdaq, uh, NYS, or um, London. We have 
at, at a pinch. Got to be worth it, yeah. Yeah, but not ASX. Yeah, right? so, yeah. Which, which I found a bit disappointing as an Australian because, you know, that they just felt that it was not where they wanted to, their exits to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's fair enough. If you're going looking for money from them and that's some of the conditions, then you obviously got to be fine with it. Well, I did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got we, over that. <laughs> we did. Like, all of us decided that was yeah. the way that we wanted to go yeah. in business. And it, and it sounds like you found the right partner. Like, so it's a partner that valued what you guys were bringing in terms of investor. Uh, but also, yeah, you, you, you fit what they were looking for and it worked with your growth plans and that's probably really what you're trying to do. Like that matchmaking, you find the right person. And I think the other thing is that they actually valued us. Where, mm -hmm. uh, and the nice ones, is the great things with American VCs, they don't have time to string anybody along. It's just like, come back for a second meeting, yes, no. And then, so we had a few that would take us to the third meetings. Mm -hmm. um, but it was interesting, the whole process. It was, it was really good for us to clarify what we were going to do with the funds. Because mm -hmm. the more meetings we had, the more they said, well, what's going to happen here? What's going to happen here? So by the time we ended up, um, when we got the funding, it was really easy to sort of all come in in December and we just started to execute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because we had to sort of you know, planned it all through. Yeah. And so what, what are you uh, investing that capital in? What's the future growth plan of the business? Um, my whole theory on software companies is that your, your only asset is your people. Like they, mm -hmm. everybody goes out the front door, or down the lift every day. That's the true asset of the business, and so it's really all people. Um, we have built really nice offices uh, for everybody in the business now. Where a few of our more, um, you know, Brisbane and London office are beautiful now. We we intend to put um, a high focus on the Brisbane office. It's because mm -hmm. it seems like anybody smart in IT from Brisbane is heading south. We want to mm. get up. There's a mm. few companies up there that do really well. Yeah, actually, yeah, I, I have heard, and we've had a couple on the podcast who are yeah. from up north and, and are really trying to keep that ecosystem there, which I think is yeah, absolutely should be done. And I think also you, Sydney's hard because I think the government doesn't really do much for businesses of our size. Like they, mm. they're very focused on startups, but they're not overly focused on, like I did some work with um, David Thady with Jobs for New South Wales mm -hmm. and they were, calling us a gazelle and all this sort of thing. I had to look up what it was. There's OECD gazelle, which means a middle-sized business that's yeah. high growth. Um, and it was really funny. Were you laughing about me being a gazelle? <laughs> <laughs> really? I was like, why are you calling us a gazelle? I'm yeah, a yeah. unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but a gazelle was like, okay. Um, and so, but it was interesting because there is that whole focus by politicians, particularly on startup ecosystems, which I think is brilliant. Like, I love it. It's, it's half of the businesses we're talking to at the moment are partnering with are all come through all of the different, you know, startup um, uh, incubators, etc. Mm -hmm. But, you know, mm -hmm. it's really good. And they're, and they're actually bringing us great commercial opportunities. Mm. Now, particularly one company we're working with at the moment that's doing this phenomenal travel, you know, um, how uh, the side of work that none of us think about, weather and, and public transport. Mm. You know, mm. and that's really interesting on how that plays out to productivity and engagement mm -hmm. um, if you can't get to the place easily. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that relationship would never happen with if we didn't have what we're doing in Australia. Yeah. Yeah, you know, but then at the same time, I, you know, the whole gazelle side is that there is nothing really aimed at that middle tier business. They've yeah. got to, you know, hope for a buoyant VC space because the startup space you know, and then the R&D situation has made life hard mm. for companies yeah, of our that's, size. Yeah, that's definitely made things challenging. Yeah. And so, um, I, I, last year I want to touch on, before I've got a couple of questions to wrap up on, is around your US expansion and what you're planning on there and maybe what are some of the things that you've already learned about the US market? Um, well, really for the US, it's, it's one of those things that we, I think, more than anything else is that we will do it in a in a controlled manner mm -hmm. i had done it previously like in 1988 and 2000 mm -hmm. uh and and failed in 88 so that was a long long time ago mm -hmm. um but it's it's interesting that there's still australian companies that are like crashing on the floor uh, on the um on the floor or on the beaches of, of california like they just get there and they just crash out and go what happened mm. yeah so for us um, having an american partner Mm -hmm. um, they gave us some really phenomenal board members. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, one of them is the CEO of a global CRM organisation. He sits mm -hmm. on our board. Mm -hmm. Those sort of things are phenomenal. So he, they're actually going to pave the way. Mm -hmm. They're looking at M&A for us already as a way mm -hmm. to get into market. Mm -hmm. But we'll go mm -hmm. into California as our first port, yep. port of call. Yeah, and, and, then, and then really pick your areas or the states that you'd be playing in first and expand that way? or. Look, I'd love to think it's that logical, but mm. I, was, I think I was listening. It was um, the the uh, gentleman from Safety Culture when yeah, looking here, yeah, yeah, like Kansas City. Look, I've been there. Like, yeah. that's, that's that's a that would be a big time in that town because yeah. it's a it's a it's a smaller city. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's just where people are. Like, it's it's odd. Um, but it, we will be doing it with some structure. So we'll go NorCal, Sal, and then we go SoCal, probably down around um, John Wayne Airport in that area mm -hmm. and Irvine. 
Um, and then we're trying to work out middle, most likely Dallas. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Possibly Austin, it's a bit expensive. Yep. Uh, and then either Atlanta or up on the other, uh, you know, looking at the northeast. So, but where the, they're all areas where our clients are currently headquartered. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we can, and we've got Australian companies over there, such as, um, you know, for, Forever New and all these other ones that are Australian retailers over there use us there as well. So we've got a footprint. Oh, great. People using our software all, every day. Yeah, you we're get, just not there. You've got a partial roadmap, and then like every great entrepreneur, some opportunity will come up, and you're like, "Great, Toronto." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe <laughs> Toronto. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? All right, I've got a couple of questions here that. Um, thank you for holding my clipboard throughout no, that's this. All right. It's been very nice of you. <laughs> got a couple of questions here that I haven't seen, you haven't seen. We try and race through them in a minute. Rapid fire. We never, we never make a minute. Okay. I don't think we've ever actually timed it, but it's definitely not a minute. <laughs> okay, great. So, Bruce, uh, final round of questions. What's the most rewarding aspect of building an international team? Um, as an Australian company, knowing that you're world class. Yep, yeah, fantastic. That's it, you know you're up there. Yeah, great. Second question, what's the most challenging aspect of building an international team? Tyranny of distance and time, mm -hmm. and also we think we know what we're doing here and we have no idea when we go to new markets and it's, 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 that's great fun, that's a challenge of it, but that's yeah. the hardest part, tyranny of distance. So it's just everyone getting everyone on the same page, the communication, time zones, that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, that and, and that and just understanding how the cultures are different as far as their, their work patterns and mm. you know, it's, it's, every country is different, there's nothing, we never see anything the same, yeah. you know, they're all different. Yeah, yeah, it would be interesting once you've cracked it, but when you're still trying to figure it out, it could be very frustrating. <laughs> yes. Uh, what's your number one tip for recruiting? Um, oh, th this is just me personally. I have a recruiter in the business, but when I interview people, I really like people who've got a background in a fami family background in small business. I've, I've, I've seen a, a trade of that or they've worked in small business. I think um, SMEs create, uh, you know, you've got all hands on deck when things are problematic. Uh, the culture of a person whose parents have had a business mm. or they've worked in a small enterprise. Yeah. Um, and you know, as we grow, we're looking for people from large enterprise experience now because we're, we're, a lot of our people are small enterprise experience. Yeah. <laughs> so it'll be evolving. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I actually still say um, that everyone should have had a background in hospitality. I think as your first gig coming, whether it's while you're still at school or maybe when you're going through university, I think everyone should work in hospitality because it teaches some pretty important stuff. So that's what I look for all the time. Okay. Uh, and final question. If a business, business owner wants to bootstrap their business, what would be the first and most important piece of advice you'd give them to make it happen? Cash is everything. Mm -hmm. If people, they, with or without capital, if you're bootstrapping, you've got, to, you've got to manage your cash really closely. You must know what your debtors are. You must know when a client's not happy because they're not going to pay your bill or if they're a monthly client and, you know, and, they haven't, and they've got issues. Mm -hmm. you know, they've all got to be references. And so mm -hmm. therefore, if you manage it off your cash line, which we had to, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. it's really, and we have to pay wages every fortnight. Mm -hmm. you know, so that, that's the hardest thing. So that's where everybody fails. They either burn through their cash or they, or they suddenly realise, oh, we haven't got the right people on board for the wrong reasons or right reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah, so for me, everything was cash. It always yeah. will be. And why do you think so many business owners don't like looking at their finances? I think, I think they do when they can't make wages. They'll get mm. really good at it. Cause <laughs> I think, but I think if, you, if you've had a good run, then you, I think most people, that you, if you have an entrepreneurial seizure, like you suddenly just go, I want to have a business, I don't think it was ever to sit there and go, hey, let's do a cash flow projection and work out how we're going to run for the next two, two months. You know, there's nobody ever said, you know, let's do accounting 101, this is going to be exciting. Because <laughs> you, you run around, all you want to do is, you know, spike the ball and run around yeah. and say what deals you've got, like I've been doing. Yeah. But, you know, there was a lot of long nights and, you know. You, you earn your right to be there. Yeah, you, you, you get to know your bank manager pretty well. Yeah. And last thing, it's not on our list of questions, what are you most excited about uh, for the coming year? This year? Um, I'm excited. I'm excited for for Australia to continue to be, uh, you know, what it's doing in technology at the moment. I, I love the fact that wherever we go, we're well regarded, mm. and I want us to stay that way. I don't want us to have any epic failures or you know stuff ups. I just love the fact that an Australian company gets you get you know UK, uh, Europe, US. We've had no pushback being a, you know from a, a you know a country the size of the US with a population of Texas, you know. So they they all know and they know yeah. and they really um, you know. Atlassian and Richard's business, like the work that he's done there is just 
um, uh, 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 sorry, I've got them wrong. That was yeah. right. I put Richard from WiseTech <laughs> and the Atlassian guys. Of, they're all both doing good stuff. Though. They're, no, <laughs> they're all doing a phenomenal thing. But yeah. it, I think if that's what's the, the best part of our business at the moment is that Australian technology and software is really highly regarded offshore. Mm. Well, Bruce McKenzie, thank you for flying the flag. Good <laughs> luck with all it. Thank you very much for being here today. Thanks, mate. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Make It Happen Show. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. And it doesn't need to end there. We've actually gone and grabbed a whole bunch of extra resources for you. Behind the scenes footage, videos from this and all the other episodes, as well as show notes that you can grab for free. Just head along to www.the-entourage.com slash podcast and you can grab all those extra resources. Thanks for tuning in and I cannot wait to introduce you to our next guest on the next episode.